Let's be real, who hasn't ever dreamt about being able to render images that are indistinguishable from hand drawings? All of us had, at least once, a wet dream about making a game that looks like an interactive Studio Ghibli movie of some sort. I'm pretty sure about that. Well, why not starting to learn how close we can get to that then? Let's start from the line work and let's see how far we can go with it. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to some of the basics of image processing, while showing you what's the, let's say, standard practice to create outlines in real-time rendering. In the video that will follow this, I'll walk you through my personal take on it, which will be a more accurate way to pass through the handmade feeling of the ink. So, did you ever heard about kernels? And convolutions? Filters? In the context of image processing, they all refer to the same thing, a way to manipulate the values contained in a digital image to change, modify or extract some data contained in its pixels. What they do in practice is, per pixel, to look at also the neighbors, multiply them by certain numbers and add all the results together. You can imagine it like a little grid with a number in each cell. You can center it over a pixel and then you multiply all the pixels covered by the grid by their respective number. Then you add all the results and assign the final value to the output image at the position that corresponds the one of the grid. You repeat this process for every pixel in the starting image and you obtain a new one with the filter applied. That's it. Building a convolution kernel in a real is as simple as tedious. As mentioned a few moments ago, we just need to sample the current pixel, multiply it by a number and add it to the final result. And we have to do the same on all its neighbors, which means doing a nice column of almost identical nodes 8 more times. The only difference is that these ones will have an offset to the UVs. To offset each one of these nodes to sample a different neighbor pixel, we need to multiply the texel size by the direction of where they lie relatively to our current one and add the result to the UVs. With so many nodes, it's a bit hard to create a tidy visualization, but we can visualize our kernel by positioning all the scaling coefficients like this. So, how can this thing generate lines? Everything depends on which numbers we set here in the kernel. There is a ton of different well-known kernel values that have different applications, and loads of them are built for edge detection as well. As far as I'm concerned, the simplest one is also the one which returns the best output, the Laplacian. Without going too technical, what this filter does is to return a value, either positive or negative, further from zero the more quickly the pixels inside the kernel change in value, which can essentially be considered the definition of the concept of line in this case. To understand why I'm saying this, try to imagine to draw a scene. You are most likely to draw a line along the silhouette of an object, and where that same object has maybe a sharp edge or a part that causes self-occlusion. Which leads to the next thing I'm going to talk about. At the moment, our filter is generating something that gives the feeling of a line work, but it's not that accurate. Since we're applying it to the final render of the image, it's reading as edges things like the shadows too. Moreover, it's also picking up some ambient occlusion and other stuff that make the result a bit dirty. Luckily, in a 3D environment, we have much more available to us than just the final image. You'll see in a moment why, but everyone's favorite data to apply this filter on are the depth and normal passes. It may seem kinda obvious once you're staring at them, but applying the Laplacian here will focus the edge detection on the structural parts of the image, a much more accurate approximation of the lines that an artist will draw. Let's see how they look like. By applying the filter to the depth pass, we can highlight very well all the silhouettes of the various objects. There are some cases where it falls short though. For example, you can see how we are not seeing some edges that we may want to. And for this reason, this filter is usually applied to the normal pass too. This time we can clearly see the edges we were missing before. In this case, they're colored because the normal pass has three channels and the filter runs on all of them, detecting different edges. To merge all of them into one, we just have to take the maximum value of every channel result. 
However, as you can see, this one falls short in other cases where the depth one worked perfectly, like when two different objects have their faces oriented in the exact same way. And that's why you usually want to apply the same filter to both of them at the same time. Together, they can complement each other and you can generate an overall better quality line work. Now, I know what you might be thinking. All this looks good on the cubes, but do you want to ignore all the ugly stuff that's going on around them? Nope, definitely not. The reason why I'm shamelessly showing you the filters doing a crappy job is to raise the quality bar for this tutorial. See, what I often see when other people illustrate this technique is that they only show you it working on some basic shapes, and that's it. Then you go and apply the stuff on a real case scenario and you discover that the matter is not that simple after all. And what's the most problematic thing you could apply these filters on? Photorealistic assets, of course. Their geometry is much more intricate and the normals apply to them much more noisy that I bet you can see why they represent a very good stress test. So, let's talk a bit about how to manipulate the filter's output to have a better result. Before doing any weird manipulation, we need to understand the range of the values we're working with. Otherwise, it becomes just a random tinkering of the values, in the hope to magically find a good setup. As in almost everything related to computer graphics, the ideal scenario would be having to deal with values in the 0-1 range. In the normal pass case, this is very possible to obtain. We know that every channel in this pass can range from minus 1 to 1, which means that we can figure out which are the edge cases for the Laplacian filter. The highest possible output can be reached only if the central pixel is either 1 or minus 1 and all the neighbors its negation, which leads to the conclusion that the highest absolute value we can possibly see outputted here is 16. So let's divide everything by that number and see what comes out. You might think that by dividing the values I just made every edge less bright, which technically is exactly what I did. But the point is that now we can read this output as a map of how sure the filter is that every pixel represents an edge, where white means definitely an edge, black absolutely not an edge, and all the grays in between range from there is a remote chance to kinda sure it's an edge. This now allows us to fine-tune the convolution outcome and define some threshold to reduce or increase its sensibility. Then we can append a 1- node at the end, just to preview how it will look as black on white. As far as the depth convolution is concerned, the matter is a bit more complex than that. Since a pixel can potentially be at any distance from the camera, there's no initial range of values to use for our normalization. But we can still do something, let's have a look at the filter. If we separate the neighbor's weights from the central one, we notice something. All the neighbors are equally weighted and all added up together, which is the first step to calculate the average of a list of values. So, if we then divide the result by the number of elements, 8, we get the average depth of the neighbor pixels. Then, if we add this average to the depth value of the middle pixel, we get the average distance of the evaluated pixel from its neighbors, which finally gives a meaning to the filter output and a hint on how we can work with it. All this convoluted explanation simply translates to dividing by 8 the final output of the filter. Now that we know what the values contained in this image are, we can work out a way to manipulate them. We can remap them to a 0-1 range of our choice, by thresholding them so that we define how much difference in depth units there has to be from the pixel and its neighbors before starting to consider it an edge, and after how much we consider it to be one for sure. You can see how now we are losing some important edges where different geometries are closer than our threshold, but we are also removing all those ugly lines that the filter was drawing on mesh triangles. As with the normal filter, we can preview it as an income paper image by adding a 1- minus node at the end. Let's combine their scaled values together and let's invert their values too. Now, what if we'd like to have thicker lines? One may think about increasing the offset to true 3 or more pixels to expand the reach of the kernel. That wouldn't be an entirely wrong solution. Let's see its outcome. 
it still holds pretty well, but we can see that something weird starts to happen, and the higher the offsets, the more evident it becomes. This happens because by doing this we are creating gaps inside the kernel, so the total area considered by it starts to have blind spots inside. To remedy that, we are forced to just use bigger kernels. So, if instead of using the current 3x3 kernel, we use a 5x5, we would increase the thickness of our lines by 2 pixels. The saddest part about this is not performances, is that increasing the kernel size increases exponentially how tedious the node implementation becomes. Look at this. <laughs> At least it's not that difficult to figure out which weights to use in the bigger kernel. Just set all the neighbors to minus one and make all the central weights equal to the number of neighbors we are evaluating. And of course this question now must be asked. What if we want even thicker lines? I bet you already know the answer by now. We implement an even bigger kernel, like a 7x7. And yes, if a 3x3 meant evaluating 9 pixels and a 5x5 needed 25, a 7x7 will need a whopping 49 evaluations. That would mean doing an even taller stack of these nodes plus manually setting all the offsets and weights. That's not gonna happen. Yes, I enjoy making these tutorials for you in my spare time, but there's a limit to everything. Even though, you know, there's one thing that could convince me to do more, and that will be... Money. That's why I opened the Patreon. Uh, so if you want to support me in a tangible way, you can do it. And uh, I don't want to say anything about this in this video because that may become outdated, so follow the link in the description and give it a look. Advertising aside, it's not that if you don't pay me I'm gonna leave unresolved questions. If you wish to implement bigger kernels with nodes, I bet you already know very well what to do. As far as I'm concerned, I'll go down another route now, way more manageable and time efficient. I'll convert everything to a single custom node. I mean, why not show off some HLSL code? It's less effort and more importantly, you look way more expert than you are to non-programmers. Huge boost of confidence. If only mentioning code made you almost have a stroke and lose faith in humanity, don't despair. You'll definitely be able to keep following the video. I'll explain everything supposing that the viewer has no idea of what I'm talking about. The greatest advantage of writing this shader in code is that we don't have to manually tell the material to evaluate every specific pixel we need, but through a thing called for loop we'll be able to just define the size of the kernel we want and make it automatically go through all the single cells of the grid it defines. Let's start by defining all the variables we need, like the kernel UVs. You can see this action has creating a named root node in the material editor. Whenever you call that name, you're actually reading the value that went into it. The difference is that in code we can't just plug in anything we want, but we have to explicitly say what kind of data we want to store in it. Let's set the variable value to this thing, which is just the code equivalent of the text code node as it works inside a post-process material. It returns the viewport UVs. Then we have the texel size, which you can get through this line of code, and the pixel UVs, which will hold the coordinates of the cell currently evaluated in the kernel grid during the for loop. Now, let's finally define the thing we're doing all this for, the kernel size, and let's set it to an odd value we like. Then, let's create the variables that will store the final filter's values, which will have an initial value of 0, on top of which will be accumulated the outcome of each pixel evaluation. And, as last thing, we have to calculate the weight of the central pixel, which will be the same value used to normalize the filters at the end too. 
So, what do we put here? As previously mentioned, the Laplacian filter has a very simple rule to define the weights. Minus 1 to all the pixels except the middle one, which will be equal to the numbers of all the neighbors evaluated. And since the kernel is a square, we know that the total number of evaluated pixels will be the kernel size squared. And since there is only one central pixel, the total number of neighbors is the squared kernel size minus 1. Still with me? Good. We are now starting to build the actual logic of the convolution. The task now is to write some code that automatically iterates through all the pixels contained in the kernel, without knowing in advance how big it is. To do this kind of things we use the for loop, a structure that repeats specific lines of code as many times you want, until certain conditions are met. It looks like this, and you can read it like, start with this variable that is initially equal to this value. Until it is less than this other value, keep repeating all the code contained between these two brackets. After every execution, increment the variable value by 1 and check again if the condition is still valid. Of course, depending on what we need to do, the variable name, its type, its starting value, the condition and the increment can vary. And so, what do we have to write in here? Let's study a bit our case. Since the structure we have to iterate through is a grid, we'll need two coordinates, x and y, to identify the position of a cell. But let's start simple and say that we just care about identifying the row, so let's only consider y. We know that the kernel has kernel size number of rows, and they can be either above or below the middle pixel. This splits the kernel in two and makes us understand that the rows can be at any position between negative half kernel size and positive half kernel size. We should save it to another variable, shouldn't we? Consider one thing though, since the kernel size is always an odd number, the half of it will always not be an integer. So, we have to make sure to remove the fractional part of the result. In this way, we don't risk to evaluate a point that is right in between of two different rows. So, our for loop becomes something like this. Define the coordinate y with an initial value of minus half kernel size. Until such coordinate value is less than or equal to half kernel size, keep executing the code between the brackets. After each iteration, increase the coordinate value by 1. Now that we successfully understood how to iterate through all the rows, the step to get how to iterate the columns should be pretty short. Once defined the coordinate on one axis, we just have to repeat the same logic but on the other one. So, for the x coordinate, we'll just duplicate the exact same for loop we just did and change the defined variable from y to x. This second for loop is nested inside the first one, so that we'll check for every row selected by y, every column position with x. And that's how the shader is going to automatically check every pixel inside the kernel, independently of its sides. Now it's time to tell it what to do every time it visits a cell of the grid. Here is where we have to convert to code the sampling of the depth and normal passes, along with their weighting and the addition to the filter final result. Actually, we have to first separate two different cases. We know that we'll have the same weight for all the pixels, except the central one, so we have to tell the shader to do a different thing in that case. To do that, we use an if-else statement, which is pretty straightforward. If this condition is met, execute the code between these brackets, otherwise execute the code in these other brackets. In our case, the condition will be that if at least one of the two coordinates is not equal to zero, then we are not in the central pixel. And what to do in this case? Well, first of all we calculate the current pixel UVs, like we did in nodes. Secondly, we use the pixel UVs to sample the two buffers, by calling this function twice. You can see this line of code as the HLSL equivalent of the scene texture node, where the first argument is the UV spin, the second one is the identifier of the buffer we want to sample, and the last one is this checkbox. 
How can we know at which number each pass corresponds? Just open the list of the buffers in the node and count their position, starting from 0. So, depth pass is 1 and normal pass is 8. Good. Now, it's worth noticing that these two lines of code, as they are now, are completely useless. Or we save their outputs into new variables for later use, or we use them directly to update the value of existing ones. Since what we have to do with each pixel is to negate it and add it to the filter result and nothing more, I'd say we should go for the second option. We can compress the negation and addition in a single subtraction that we apply to the respective filter results. Minus equal is just a short form to say decrement this variable value by this other value. Last thing to do to complete these two lines of code is to add what's the equivalent of the component mask node in the material editor. Now, what do we do if we are in the central pixel? Nothing much different than the other case, we just change few things around. We still have to accumulate the sampled values to the filters, but with a different weight. This time though, we don't subtract, but add the result. We don't calculate the pixel UVs, but we use the kernel ones directly, and we multiply the sampled value by the centered weight we calculated at the beginning of the code. With all the weighted samples accumulated on the filters, the only thing left to do is to normalize and return the final value. Since this is an operation that comes after we went through all the pixels and we have to do just once, we now place ourselves after the for loop is ended. Let's divide both filters by the center weight. Now we have to tell the custom node to output those values and for that we use the return command. The problem is that in every code language, functions can only return one single variable, usually. In this case we have the result of two filters to return, one with three channels and one single. So we can append the second to the first and make the node return a float 4 which will contain the filter run on the normal pass in its RGB values and adapt one in the alpha channel. Keep in mind that we have to also specify in the custom node itself which type of value we want it to return, let's set it to float 4. Let's finally copy our code to the custom node, erase all this madness and run everything to see if it works. Ah, um, right. There's this dumb thing to account for when sampling gbuffers inside a custom node. All the functions made specifically to do that don't exist in the compiled version of the shader if we don't first put a syntax or node into its input bin and we give it a name. There you go, now it's working and we can freely set the outlines width as we prefer. And that's the end of part 1. If you don't want to go through the pain of implementing this thing by yourself, you can follow the link in the description to download the node ready to go. Hopefully you now have a good enough understanding of how lines are made in real-time graphics to also fine-tune them to your personal artistic taste. In the following video we'll discuss where and why this approach falls short, both visually and in terms of artistic flexibility. And then I'll run you through my personal take on the problem. See you next time!